Um, we'd, we'd had it advertised for a few weeks, and then she finally called. She was waiting for this job transfer to go through. She's in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and she was going to be transferred up here to Washington State, um, but, you know, it, the, the paperwork wasn't official, and as soon as she got the official word that she was moving, she called us. And um, they have been previous homeowners. They, unfortunately, um, they were trying to do some sort of a workout, and then something happened anyway they have a foreclosure it's uh, about two year two and a half years so she needs another you know six months uh, or so before she'll be able to qualify for financing again and um, they like to be out in the country this house just the, you know the photos suited them perfectly um, you know she, she takes care of her elderly mother who can't navigate stairs it's a rambler I mean so everything about it just kind of fit the bill they want to buy. They don't want to have to be moving a bunch of times. Um, it, you know, it's a it's a house that you know they could lease with an option to buy. So they're hoping to buy this summer. So it uh, definitely suited their need, and it suited the seller's need as well. He had uh, it was a house that he and his wife and family had lived in for a, a number of years, and then they've had it as a rental for several years. He tried to sell it this summer, and. Um, he only got one kind of lowball offer that he wasn't interested in, and so we said, "Well, what if we could get you your price? Could you, you know, could you just wait a couple years to get your price and, and rent it in the meantime?" So we actually increased his monthly rental amount that he was receiving, and uh, so he's going to get his price, and he's, you know, he's happy as happy as a clam. So if I can jump in, you targeted the pivotal point why he wasn't doing business with anyone else. It was all about the price. He had a price in his head. And he had a price he, in his head. And he wasn't going to accept anything else. Yeah. So you as an adult, and for those of you, I talk about, you know, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of, uh, you know, transactional analysis. I always have my little Bibles books here from Dr. Byrne and Dr. Uh, Harris. You approached him as an adult to an adult rather than go to a, a parent or a child state and say, well, you, you – you have no right to just want your price. You have to do this and that, and you would be argumentative, and you guys would go down the slippery slope, and you wouldn't do business. So instead, you just said, you know what? If you want that price, and suppose I could get you your price and solve the problem, could we move forward? And you saw, it sounds to me you, you didn't argue. This was a pivotal point for him. It and, was. And you found another way. Listen, I'll give you your price if. What do we call that? What do we call when we go back and forth like that, what do I usually say to a prospect? I need either blank or blank. Price or terms. Price or terms. Price or terms. Everybody understand that? Price or terms. Mr. Prospect, I can give you a price if you give me terms. You, you know, or I can give you terms if you give me the price or back and forth. Or sometimes a hybrid. You can combine the two. But the thing is, if we, if we sound, to me, when I hear other salespeople, they all sound the same to me. Why is that? <laughs> they, don't they all sound the same? Anthony's laughing. He's like, yeah, they are. <laughs> yeah, they do. <laughs> they all sound the same. And I think this is, you guys know, uh, I'm big about communication, persuasion, likability, trust. How do we, when we start out, we're so far apart. How do we bring them in closer and closer? So maybe if we're more expensive or we can't give them everything they want, but they, they desire to work with us because of that relational entity we've created, you know, where they say, hey, I like this person. I trust this person. He's not like the other 15 investors that came from the, the rich dad, dumb dad seminar or whatever, you know, <laughs> or, or whatever. You know, I think a lot of this business is just being, and we talked about this so much in Hawaii, uh, about um, sounding different than everyone else, being unique, being creative, using the science that we know, and also being a great thespian. Everybody here, is everybody here a great thespian? Brian, Brian's going, I'm no thespian. I don't even know what a thespian yeah. is. <laughs> <laughs> it just, just, you, Brian. <laughs> yes, I need to get into the terminology. <laughs> I, I'm just I'm just showing off my word of the day. That yeah. <laughs> not everybody's a lawyer around here. No, I'm a reco I'm a recovering a program. I'm a recovering attorney. I'm in a ten step program. <laughs> uh, what thespian is a fancy word for? An actor. Thank you. Okay. Just be. You have to be a great actor. And this uh, is a lot of people say, Claude, I don't want to be a phony and I and misrepresent. We're not actors to 
um, be disingenuous with people. We're actors to create an environment uh, so that's conducive to doing business. Uh, that's the way I look at it. Act, don't sell. I love that. Read that whole thing. What does that that's say? Really good. Uh, I like that from our last uh, meeting. I, I always type up my notes. It says, uh, you have a billion dollars in your bank. You don't need this deal, but you're willing to work on it to help them. Think like a billionaire, not a millionaire. Cash flow is about small ticket, multiple items, monthly residual, built, built, build it one at a time. I like that. Anybody? You nailed it, Brian. Uh, that's great. That's awesome. This is this is what I have on my desk. What? <laughs> that's funny. It, basically, I have this. I'm look at this all day long, and the I love little things around people's desk. We all, we want to have a seminar just on what's what's all the uh, tchotchkes around people's desks yeah. and everything. I mean. Uh, you know, I, you did what to me is doing, doing a self-analysis. You know, what do, um, things that matter, things that I can control, what you should focus on. Nice. Here's the two most important things on my desk. <laughs> my, this reminds me to exercise. <laughs> this reminds me to be energetic. To be energetic. Man, we, we got all the tchotchkes today. Oh, I got where, you, where I wish I was with you guys, and a hand just to say bye. <laughs> <laughs> I also have my favorite Steve Jobs quote. Who knows what it is for extra credit? Uh, should know this. Anthony, you know this. I should know this. I should know this. <laughs> it was part of his college speech, right? Um, it could have been uh, the oh the famous speech in front of um, what college was it in California? The really. Famous uh, uh, science. God, I can't remember right now. What was it, Anthony? Oh, I don't. I don't know. Oh, okay. Anyway, this uh, is this is what he said. Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. What do you think he meant by that? I'm hearing crickets. <laughs> John, you look like you want to answer. Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. What does that mean, Mr. Uh, Andrus? I nominate John. Keep it simple, Stu. Keep it simple. How many buttons on this iPhone? One little iPhone here. One little button here. Okay. How do you draw? How do you do everything on an iPhone? You know why a stylus doesn't come with the iPhone or the iPad? Because he said God gave us ten of them. He, he didn't want to have another accessory that was unnecessary. Yeah. Yeah, that you could lose. You know what they sell styluses for now, by the way? I got this one at the dollar store for a dollar. Oh, do you know the styluses go for over $100 now, some of the fancy ones? Yeah, it, it really is crazy. I think sometimes we're too complicated in our communication with people. We read a script... And and what is and I always try. What is the prospect? What's the perception of the prospect? Hi there, Mr. and Mrs. Prospect. My name's Claude Diamond, and I just came from the. Um, I just walked on some hot coals, and I want to talk to you today about wholesale <laughs> lease purchasing. You know. I'm sorry, Mr. Diamond. I don't have that script. Yeah. <laughs> and I think right away, what's the perception when we use a script? We're not a good actor. Don't can't you tell when they call you up from Pakistan or India or say, good day, good day. I'd like to speak to the person in charge of marketing, you know. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I, I can actually even attest to this. This is a true life story from back when I was in my early 20s and I was working some sort of a sales job. Last year? At, oh, bless your heart. <laughs> <laughs> that was a nice stroke there, Claude. <laughs> But, um, Wasn't a good one if you could see it, right? <laughs> <laughs> but um, but anyway, I, I I called this business owner and he said, um, hey, 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 "Hang on," he says, "Could you just talk to me?" He said, Stop, "Put put your script away." I was like, oh, "You know, <laughs> yeah." <laughs> and I mean, so he fortunately he was very nice about it, but I mean, it just totally shocked me. 
totally threw me off my game. You know, I can't remember if I ended up doing business with them or not, but, uh, you know, but I did end up having a conversation with him for a while, but I just remember going, oh my gosh, you know, script, ah, he saw right through it. So I've, I've always been a little bit anti-script ever since then. <laughs> the, the thing is, when you're reading a script, which is very, to most people, they can tell right away, unless you're a very trained actor, thespian, Yes. And the thing is, aren't you saying that all people are alike? They all have the same needs. They all have the same personality types. They all, you know, I, I think we're reducing sales to something generic where sales to me has always been the million dollar skill. There's some people in society and life, they can make as much money as they want sell, if they sell the right product or service or feature or whatever. And and some people in every company are always those one percenters, I call it. And a lot of them are intuitive or natural sales pe uh, people. My mentor, my mentor Max, was like that. He couldn't qualify or quantify why he was so good at what he did and made so much money. But he was natural. And me, I'm not a natural salesperson. I just learned from people who are better than me, smarter than me, read a lot of books about very successful people and what they do. And I practice. One of the reasons I, I was telling Anthony earlier today, we had a session before this meeting. I said, one of the reasons I love doing the training is because when I get on the phone to make my real estate phone calls, I'm honed. My, I'm warmed up. My skills are there. You know, I, and and a part of that is just practicing, listening to people, asking the right questions, open and closed ended questions, positive and negative redirection telling them it's okay to say no. All these things are for a reason. They're just, they take practice to incorporate. You know, I'm the easiest guy, you guys have heard me say this a million times, I'm the easiest guy in the world to sell it, to say schmuck, sucker on my forehead. And nobody knows how to sell me. They always sell me like, um, you know, where they do that script or they talk to you like you're an idiot or something, you know? And well, that, uh, Go ahead, Larry. It's important too to have fun with it too. You know, it's like, Say yeah, that again. I'm sorry. It's important to have fun with it as well, too. Yeah. Oh, wait a no. sec. Wait a second. You can have fun in sales. <laughs> I know. I know. It's hard to believe. Hard to believe. How do you have fun in sales? It's embarrassing. It's humiliating. You're getting rejected. It's like being in the shopping mall and you're you got presents and your pants fall down in front of Santa Claus and the kids. I mean, who doesn't love that? Well, <laughs> a wise a wise person once told me the salesman has rights. Yes, and you can fire the prospect. <laughs> the attitude is, yeah, um, you have rights in there. I'm not trying. I sell good products and services to people. I do business honestly, um, and I think we shouldn't go through life with. Uh, remember that that kick me sign that they put on your back in third grade, and you didn't, and people were kicking you down the hallway. <laughs> Nobody here went to New York City public school system, obviously, but. Uh, I did, and that's the way a lot of people go through life, I think. Well, you know, when you when you have to ask for the close, you know, seven times, that gets really old, and, and most people aren't comfortable with it after the second or third time on either end, both the giving and the receiving. So, yeah, if you can, if you can relate to people and, and, you know, truly have fun with them and get them, you know, asking them questions because you're truly interested, but you're also trying to heighten their interest, um, you can get them to sell you. And um, that's, that's the most fun. <laughs> I don't know where I read. I think John Andrus taught this to me. He says, isn't it, be is, isn't it better to make a friend than a client, than, a pro than, 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 than make a, a client? Sounds like something you would have said, John. Probably, probably very prophetic or might be answered. Yeah. When you have a, a friend or, or a client who says, you know, you're, you're like their doctor, they trust you, their lawyer, or somebody important in their world, and you've bridged that gap and have this wonderful likability and trust because you're not acting like the goofy other, the competition you have out there. Man, is that make, isn't that fun? It's relaxed. It's, it's, it's um, you know. You, you get the information from them. It's flowing. You make a lot more sales, a hell of a lot more money, do a lot more deals. And you get a lot more referrals from that person because they love to brag about you. Anybody here, here ever have a, a plumber or a favorite? You ever have a favorite restaurant and somebody said to you where to eat? 
and you have this one favorite restaurant. They always you walk in, they say hi, Anthony, you know, or it's, you know, it's like cheers, and they always take care of you. Don't you love that? Yeah. And then someone you meet, you're on the chairlift. It's cold day skiing, and you got some people from Ohio, and they say, "Where's a good place for us to go and eat with the kids?" Oh, if I got a place for you, you know, and that's the thing. I think that's what you create. Yeah. Uh, by sounding different to people. Um, absolutely. Go ahead, Larry. You look like you're dying to say something. <laughs> well, going back to uh, the, 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 the check we're going to pick up today, actually, this guy also owns 120 acres, and he's got several houses on this, this 120 acres. He's, he's in the process of retiring. So, you know, yeah, we want to take care of this guy as well, too. And, and he actually found, found us, and we didn't. How? Yeah. Well, um, apparently he'd seen, you know, he'd, he'd been advertising the property. I don't know if he saw our ads initially, but he, he ended up finding our website and he signed up on our sellers list. And um, so, you know, we called him to find out, you know, what he needed and, and um, he had this property. And in the course of talking to him about this property that he wanted to sell and was open to doing a lease option on, found out that he had several other properties that he may want to do the same with over time if this one goes well. But not with you. You know, I have a feeling it might be with us. Why? It's hard, uh, why would he want to do that? <laughs> well, if you solve somebody's problem and you take their pain away and they don't have to do... I mean, he keeps telling me, you know, this guy is, you know, he's a, he's a CPA. He works as a CPA for uh, Boeing, you know, um, so he, you know... He knows numbers, uh, but he, he just he, he has said to us over and over again, "Well, you guys are the experts, you know. Well, what?" And he keeps asking us for our advice. Well, what do you think we should do? You know, how much of a deposit should we ask? And and, and should, can we raise our? Do you think we should raise our rent? And and you know. How do you feel about that relationship? I love that relationship. <laughs> because. Um, well, it one it's um, it's a lot of fun to help somebody. I mean. We did. We, we came into this business because we wanted to make money, and I wanted to be able to quit my job. But the side benefit has been, um, we end up helping people and solving their problems, and and many of them have become friends. And it's it's a cool benefit that we couldn't have predicted, um, and that we weren't seeking, but we love it. It's it's a great you know it's great fun and. You know, like you said, either, you know, either they refer you to them, you know, to other people or, you know, we have several people now who we have done multiple deals with. You know, we've done five deals with this one investor and four or five deals with another investor. And, you know, there's a builder who we've done a number of deals with. You know, so we're, we're tr it's just great to be able to help these people because that's not their area of expertise. You know, they're very smart at what they do, but they recognize us as being the experts in our field. Do you ever have any? I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say that solves a specific problem for them. Do you ever have any hesitation to pick up the phone and call this person? Oh gosh, no. Why not? Uh, well, only if it's like New Year's Eve. Yeah, well, I probably would call on New Year's Eve, but <laughs> but then <again. laughs> I, I'm kind of segueing here that when you have these kind of relationships or when you have this attitude. You can pick up the phone and just call these people and talk to them. You're not hesitant or that fear, that phobia of rejection or being yeah. humiliated or treated badly. I think this is the number one reason why people fail. Um, uh, thank you so much for saying that because I, you know what, that's never really, I've never really been consciously aware of that, but that's absolutely right. I mean, you, you talked with us from the very beginning about being the professional, being being the doctor, being the attorney who, who is the consultant, who is the advisor. And I, I guess we just internalized it without really being consciously aware of it. But, yeah, I feel like I could just, any one of these people, I could just call them up and, and you know, they're happy to hear from us. Do you think this eventually um, transfers to cold calls and strangers or very lukewarm leads? Do you think eventually you can just pick up the phone? Someone has an ad for a property for sale or for rent in Craigslist, a sign on their lawn, 
um, Zillow, Trulia, Redfin, uh, the MLS, the, uh, a realtor, a mortgage broker? Do you think you could just, without hesitation or reluctance, go to that phone and call up those people? And how many, truth be told, I know I've suffered from it, where I would have, I'll clean the, all the toilets in the house. You know, honey, where's the brush? Rather than make those phone calls, you know? Uh, I mean, because in, am I with? Am I the only one who's felt like that? I think. Uh, go ahead. No, no, we're just gonna go ahead. I'll, no, I was I'll just talk say, after you. I was just gonna say. I think cold calls for anyone. The natural inclination is to kind of freeze up, but I think that when you start realizing that you are the consultant, it puts a whole different spin on it. I'm not going to somebody asking for their help. I'm going to them offering a solution. Go ahead, Anthony. I was describing to someone, and keep in mind, I'm still learning so much about this in the guts method, and I was describing to someone the significance of what Claude teaches and what we do, and it just kind of hit me, um, and I said to them, he takes the rejection out of the selling process. Perfect. And you can, you can do that by excusing the clients uh, and by your attitude, and uh, gets in there very uh, quickly qualifies qualifies them, finds out if they're a fit either way, and if they're not, very eloquently excuses them, and and we're still on good terms, and everybody walks away, or at least especially the salesperson walks away feeling good. Especially the salesperson. <laughs> yep. And uh, but you know, and it's not with, with the with the potential client, the door's not closed. We have we haven't pissed them off, or like you know, it's still open for the future because of the way we have approached them and excused yeah. ourselves or them from the process if it doesn't work out. Well, why should I work with you? Why should I work with you? Are you another one of those bottom-feeding sales guys? You know, you're the third guy to call me today from that uh, Craigslist ad. Why should I work with you, Martinez? Well, Claude, I mean, I don't, I don't know if you should. You, That's, hey, the you should. That's the answer. That's the answer. Hey. Good. That's the answer. <laughs> problem and I, I was just trying to find out if maybe we could help you solve it if not no big deal see what but if so that's the adult isn't it what would the child or the parent or the emotional i'll get you back salesman what would that i'll tit for tat guy well, or girl what would they sound like why oh. should i work why should i work with you and then they start getting that defensive thing well i've been in business for five years and i'm a really good person i'm very honest and I know what I'm talking about. I don't need to take this from you. You know, and they got emotional. Who would, Do you make a sale? Do you make money today when you take on that attitude? Stapler's on the market. You cannot top the stapler. So you need to buy the stapler. I already have a stapler. Not like this. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's not going to be better than, it's going to be better than scotch. Right? It's going to be better than scotch tape. I use scotch tape on everything. Why should I use a stapler? I've got a per look at it. I got a whole roll here. My wife got it at Walmart for Christmas. Yeah, it's, it's, it's listing features. There you go. There is a stapler for you. Oh shit. <laughs> okay, now we now we're on the hunt for twenty first century. <laughs> here. 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 Plastic paper. <laughs> Does, does everyone, uh, does every, I got a salesman emergency kit, this is fun. Did everyone get the uh, salesman emergency kit for Christmas? It's still good. Oh, my God. Oh. Pass that through the video. <laughs> <laughs> things, things we have on our desk. <laughs> I do, if, if I'm on a, if I'm on a video, oh, my gosh. Are you gonna? Are you gonna? Are you gonna grow a beard and marry your sister now? What is? <laughs> hey, she's not bad. <laughs> it's all relative, isn't it? So why should I marry your sister? <laughs> <laughs> Anthony, let's. Um, we were touching a little bit on transactional analysis. There is a point to this. Um, very quickly, Anthony, summarize. You brought up the last minute uh, before we got off the phone before. Uh, it, we did the analogy. You're in a car. Your your nine year old little boy is in the back seat, um, and somebody on the 405. Wait, you're in Ohio. What's your big highway there? Do you have a highway in? Uh, highway 275. 275. 
should have had a contest for that. You're on 275, and that one guy who's late for work, and he's just changing lanes without signal lights, and he cuts right in front of you with a few inches at 68 miles an hour. You hit the brakes. You go <gasps> like that, and, you know, and... and what, let's talk about that for a second. How do you react? You were asking me about emotional ve being into versus intellectual. And we were talking about uh, the emotional response of anger and where that comes from. Retribution. Could be, uh, I saw my parents act this way uh, in the same situation, so I will now do that. I, I brought, I've carried that behavior with me which is uh, the parental side of things. Um, or then the, there's the child side, which, which can be very playful, but can also be somewhat you know, spoiled uh, or manipulative. Like, um, you know, this is my road and this person's on my road. So there's another response that, that comes from these differing ego states, which is what we were talking about. And, and what is the one you would strive for? You, lo you, lost your, you lost your control. You became emotional, which is hardwired into our, our fight and flight. And our DNA says when we're in a dangerous situation, adrenaline, a chemical kicks into our body. We react that way. We become very emotional. right? That, and then what, where do we want to go to? And this really relates to sales and success a lot. Instead of staying emotional, what do we try to do? Then we want to bring ourselves up to the adult stage, the logical thinking mind, uh, which we say to ourselves, hey, whoa, calm down. Uh, let's just forget about that. Let's uh, keep our eyes on the road. We don't want to do something stupid. I got my son in the back of the car. Let's just uh, let's be calm and be safe. Anthony, your product, your real estate deal, you're offering me $10,000 less than the other guy. <laughs> well, uh, why, why do you think that is, Claude? Why, why would I? He wants to give me $10,000 more than your offer with that crazy lease purchase stuff. I mean, yeah, I mean, it, that's what he says. Uh, do you think he'll be able to do it? Uh, when the chips fall, or let me switch to uh, 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 Brian. You want to jump in on this? Sure. Uh, well, Claude, it sounds like a great deal. Why didn't you take it? That's the answer. Very good. That is that's the answer. That's the perfect. You get an A plus there. Yeah, that's the adult answer. You know, I, you give them a stroke, you nurture. You know what? If I had a good offer, like why? Did, there must have been a reason you didn't accept. It sounds like a good offer. And then they backpedal. They're either trying to lie. Or they did get the offer, but they're not giving you all the information, all the information. or something like that. they got to wait 15 years to get that price. So maybe we can renegotiate for five years and give them the same price or something. We can fix it. But we can't get in a, you know, pardon the language, lady, uh, uh, Mariska. Um, you know, we can't get in a pissing match with these people. What, what, is he done yet? My one, my one friend, Niles Larson, used to always say, never get into a pissing match with a skunk. You know, <laughs> you have to warn me before you say anything. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, you know, it's just we don't want to get it. Is, this is so hard. I'm a hypocrite here because we get caught up in this stuff all the time, don't we? we get caught up in, yeah, yeah. We, we 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 always get caught up in it, and we don't win. We don't make the sale when we become argumentative. Do we get further apart or closer when we become argumentative or defensive? Or we become manipulative, and then they become manipulative. We do we we get further apart, don't we? Yeah. On uh, this stuff, uh, I just, go ahead. I, I'm not sure you're saying going ahead too. But oh, I thought but, someone had a comment. Well, I'll just pipe in. I, I didn't have a comment, but I was just it just reminded me of something. Um, years ago, I used to work um, for a mortgage broker, and um, I, every time I'd bring them a deal. Um, I, I, you know, kind of give him a little synopsis, a little executive summary about, you know, this borrower. And he'd say, yeah, well, what aren't you, you know, what else? You know, the, basically, this sounds too good to be true. What aren't you telling me? You know, and, uh, and, you know, he did that because he had years of experience and he knew that, you know, a lot of these, you know, there, there was usually an untold story. You know, the, the salesperson would want to present the best, you know, scenario, but there's always the reasons why underwriting might not, you know, find this borrower the, the most desirable. And I remember one time without even 
knowing guts, I don't know where I came up with this idea, but I'd kind of been looking for some other brokers and I said, Hey, no worries. Um, I'll just, uh, I'll just take it across town to so-and-so. And he's like, let me look at it. <laughs> so I did a takeaway without really knowing what I was doing. <laughs> yeah. And takeaway is, um, what is another word for takeaway? Um, scarcity. Yeah. Um, great book um, by Dr. Help me out. Uh, no Caldini, Cialdini. The, has everyone read that book? And I'm going to, um, there's a wonderful, uh, Cialdini, and the name of the book is The Power of Persuasion and Influence, oh. um, something like that. Oh, let me look up my books here. You guys got to read it if you haven't read that book already. I'll show you my little book list here. Um, influ influence. Let's see here. Uh, Influenced by Robert Cialdini. C-I-A-L-D-I-N-I. -I -I. And Doc... Let me get that. And uh, mm -hmm. Influence the Power of Persuasion. Great book. Talks about all the different things that motivate people. Uh, how do we persuade people, influence them by scarcity, by um, um, professionalism, um, a, lot of different, a lot of different ways why people buy things. My favorite book of all time, by the way, as long as we're talking about books, um, has become finally, um, I think I told all of you, but if you haven't, if you, you can get this now on Kindle. It's called Zeckendorf. If you has anybody here read that book yet? No, if you mentioned the other day, I uh, tried to find it. It's it's expensive. But, no, uh, it uh, was. You can download it on Kindle or Amazon Kindle for like nine or ten bucks. Ten nine ninety nine now. It's finally been released. This man was the man who built New York City, uh, Manhattan skyline. He built the UN. He owned the land by the UN, which he sold to the Rockefellers for one dollar because he optioned all the land around it. And he knew that all the diplomats were going to need expensive housing and stuff. They used to be the uh, low-rent um, uh, slaughterhouse district in, in, in lower Manhattan, which today is some of the most phenomenally expensive property in the world. Okay. And this guy, he, did, he was a, the original wheeler and dealer uh, doing deals with uh, options. And he'd borrow from Peter to pay Paul. He was always juggling deals. He went bankrupt a couple times. Um, but... There's so much to get to learn about creative real estate in that book. You'll you'll believe me. You will pick it up and not put it down uh, with you. So, and 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 uh, what uh, John uh, said before was true. An original copy of that book that's autographed goes for thousands of dollars. You go go on eBay and look for it. It's uh, it depending on the condition and stuff like that. It's a real collector's item. Um, probably one of the best creative real estate books written. Um, so definitely read it. One of my other favorites, I'm going to surprise you, um, is the original Donald Trump book, The Art of the Deal. Art of the Deal. Yeah. Did any, everybody here, anybody here read that book? Um, great story in the beginning of that book about um, in New York City, once again, there's uh, the main train station in lower Manhattan is Grand Central Station. It used to be the seediest part of New York. And there was an old hotel across it. And they were trying to sell it forever. And he said, you know, um, let, let's take that. Let me, he negotiated a great deal on this hotel, um, got it under a contract, okay? And then, and he figured out, you know what? People taking trains all day long. A lot of people want to have business meetings or need a place to stay, but they don't want to stay in a CD hotel. They're business people. They don't want to stay in a place with drug dealers and other negative people there. Um, I'm trying to be nice here. Uh, <laughs> and so he got the contract, and then he went to the city of New York, and he got them to give them uh, 20 years tax-free on the building. He said, look, it was a bad time in New York, and, he, and they said, well, we've never done that before. And he said, well, if you want me to go ahead with this, fixing, uh, buying this hotel and fixing it up, uh, because I'm going to hire a lot of people, bartenders and, and chambermaids and, and, and elevator people and, and all that, 
He said, I want a, uh, I don't want an abeyance or whatever you call it for 20 years. They gave it to him. Then he went to uh, one of the Hilton or one of the big hotel chains and said, look, I got a great deal on this hotel. It's across from Grand Central Station. 20 years, tax-free. Okay. And so he got a major hotel. And then he took, all these, he took all this. And then he went to Citibank. And he said, Citibank, I need a loan. And look, Hilton signed up. No taxes. And all this stuff. And so they gave him a loan for his side of the thing. He put the deal together literally with optioning and negotiation. And I think, you know, whatever you feel, whatever you feel, um, whatever you feel, uh, that's, that's the art of the deal. That's real negotiation. And if you ever go to Grand Central Station, there's a beautiful, I forget the name of the hotel, the Concord or whatever. It's right there. And, you know, $500, I think the room started $500 a night. Hotels are very expensive in New York. Uh, according to the book, that was the first one he did. Yes. Is that right? That was his first hotel. Yeah. And he had a, his father was in real estate before him. His father built a, a Levittown or one of the big developments in Long Island and okay. stuff. Anybody else have a favorite book they want to share with us for the new year? I just typed it in there. The message. I'm sorry? I just typed it in there. The little instant, instant message thing, the... The one thing by Gary uh, Keller and uh, Thou Shall Prosper by Rabbi Daniel Lapin. Oh, yeah, yeah. Great book. Thank you. I read it in the airport finally. Oh, good. Yes. <laughs> Why is that your favorite book? Which one? Thou Shall Prosper. Well, it really just kind of takes uh, the whole thing from perspective. It's, it's okay to talk to It's okay to, and it, and it goes back down to, I mean, you think about it, the Jewish culture has been persecuted for thousands and thousands of years, but they just always keep bouncing back. And and there's the uh, the thing I think that sometimes people put on money or the stigma on money is like it's not it's not it's not a no good thing to talk it's not okay to talk about money. But yeah, I mean we were even just you know, we were at a party yesterday. We were at an open house, and people were asking us about um, you know what we were doing and everything. And even though they were asking us, um, I almost sensed that some people started getting a little... I mean, we weren't talking about like how much money we made or anything like that, but you could almost tell that they were starting to get a little uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were interested, but kind of uncomfortable. And so we had this really uneasy relationship with money, um, I think, as a culture, and um, you know, particularly as an American culture. And um, I, I think for us, anyway, that book really kind of helped us kind of get our arms around things and say, you know what? Uh, when we make money, everyone else benefits too. You know, when we do well, when we tell people what, what we're doing, you know, we're not only helping ourselves, but we're helping other people and vice versa. So um, there were a whole lot of lessons in there for us. But, um, you know, I think it really helped us with our networking and, and you know, being being comfortable with what we're doing. Because there, there is this stigma, I think, for a lot of Americans. Even though we want to make money, we're kind of embarrassed by it. I mean, you look at um, he, he talked, talked about if he went into Starbucks, which he, he totally admires, you know, Starbucks, and he was reading their brochure about Starbucks gives back. And um, they were talking about all these things that Starbucks does to give back to the community. And he goes, and all of it was wonderful and great. And he says, and, and that's so nice. But he said, why? He goes, I would have really appreciated a, a booklet about Starbucks about how they provide uh, great benefits for their employees. They provide a great community uh, they have a health plan. They have a health plan, but they also just provide a, a, a place where people can come together and relax with a great cup of coffee and meet with their friends or meet with their business associates. That they've created these little community hubs all over the place. That they've helped their shareholders have a more secure retirement because they offer great returns. So it was almost like, yeah, we're in business, but but we also do good things too, you know. And it's like, no, just the act of being in business is a good thing. Yeah, you know, Pe and. People who think differently. Uh, yeah. I mean, take something as simple as coffee. Does anyone here remember what coffee used to taste like in America? <laughs> Crap. <laughs> what, you mean that sawdust? <laughs> oh, man, you know, I, I cheers. <laughs> coffee used to be, I don't know what it was, but it wasn't coffee. You go to Europe or anywhere else, and oh, my God, what is this strange brown is substance? Oh, that's coffee. How come it doesn't taste like that at home? And it wasn't that long ago. Same thing with beer. Anybody? Do we have any beer, craft beer aficionados here? Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. 
Sure. How many, every major city or estate now has little craft beer places, entrepreneurs, mom and pops, starting up and making wonderful, tasty beer, and nobody's drinking Coors or Budweiser anymore. It's really hurting their sales. If you're reading the Wall Street Journal and stuff like that, their sales are, they've lost a significant portion of their client, of their uh, customers. Yeah, because they're they, now they, getting, they're trying to get into that microbrew space as They well. won't drink that swill. Who, uh, anybody read Inc. Magazine here? I love, I read the New York Times every day, the Wall Street Journal. I get time and a lot of, uh, I even read Sunset um, and everything. You can see the gray hairs. Um, but uh, Inc. Magazine nominated uh, uh, a company for the company of the year. Did anyone, uh, anyone know who that is? What that is? Airbnb. Oh. Does everybody know what Airbnb is? They took something, you know, and you got to, I love reading about people who take these simple ideas. All they did is go to people who have apartments or houses that are not using them. And they said, here's a system. We have the software in the system where, and the money to collect it and everything. And you can put people in your apartment and help subsidize your rent. I go to New York City a lot. My daughter lives there. I do business there. Do you know what a room and a clean and I underline the word clean, decent hotel. <laughs> the plot, I mean, you start at a Marriott or a Days Inn. If you, uh, there is not a Days Inn. There's, um, oh, God, a Holiday Inn. Or, they're like four or $500 a night. The Plaza Hotel goes up to 2500 a night. It's, and the taxes, are, there's like three, four taxes on top of that. And then there's a gauntlet you have to go through tipping everybody. Right. All I right. want is a clean bed and a toilet, you know, <laughs> So now when we go to New York, we rent, uh, we rent these beautiful apartments of one or two blocks from Central Park. And we can walk everywhere. And they're literally half the price. Wow. And, and the last apartment we had was a two-story apartment, totally refurbished, two blocks from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I think, uh, yeah. And um, they even stocked the refrigerator and the bar for us. And I think it was um, $280 a night, which is phenomenally cheap for this beautiful apartment wow. uh, in New York City yes. Airbnb but what are they what they did is they took face uh, what they what you're seeing on Facebook and Twitter and applied it to um, just people renting out their apartments now there's a lot, and they didn't ask permission by the way um, oh anybody here hear of Uber yeah Uber yes. this is very there's a story behind Uber that not many people know about what is the one thing that Uber is doing that only entrepreneurs would do? That only entrepreneurs would do? Yeah. Well, true entrepreneurs, do they, they – I love the expression, it's better to ask forgiveness than beg they're, permission. Yeah. That's what they're doing. They're, they're asking yeah. they're paying forgiveness rather than asking they right. did. They just went willy nilly into it. They right in, jumped right in, beat jumped first. right in, no licensing, nothing, and said, "Hey, if you've got a car and it's black, or you can paint it black, and we, you know, and you can fill out a form, we'll make you a taxi driver." And they have an application, and the, once again, the kids, social networking and everything. You go to any major airport now, and there's 15, 20 little black cars driving around your map uh, in your Google Maps now. Yep. Anybody know how much they made on New Year's night? Oh, wow. No, hundred. They brought in gross $100 million. Wow. $100 million. No joke. Wow. And, and this is this is the thing, the rule I took about. It. I love studying entrepreneurs and successful ideas and companies. They just did this thing. Yeah. They just they just went ahead and now, uh, like in San Diego, a taxi cab license is worth about a hundred. Well, it used to be worth about a hundred thousand dollars, because there's a limited amount of licenses for taxis. And so what they usually do is they have one license per taxi and, and that taxi is running 24-7 and they lease it out to people and stuff like that. That's how the taxi cab business works. And um, what is that license worth now if anybody with a black um, excursion or, or yeah. whatever can go around and drive people? Yeah. I'm not defending what they're doing, but I respect the, you know, we, we started out this conversation with simplicity is the ultimate solution. How many people here have had a bad cab drive? <laughs> we thought we were going to die. We thought we were going to die. <laughs> Did you ever get in the smelly cab? Yeah. yeah. 
Did you ever get in the cab with a back seat? There was a dead cat or something, or newspapers or beer cans or. <laughs> Michael, <laughs> Michael Buckles, are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Tell everybody what you found in one apart in one property. Does everybody? You've got to hear this story, Michael. You mind sharing with the group? Yeah, two properties I sold last year. I found two, two dead cats. No, one dead cat, one dead dog. Oh. Together in in one pro in one property or what? Uh, separate properties. Wow. Yeah. Uh, what is it like walking into an apartment uh, or, or a property with, um, is it aromatic? Uh, uh, or? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's the smell of money. <laughs> oh, no, no. I don't care what the gurus say. <laughs> That's just bad, man. <laughs> things, don't, things don't tell you at seminars and books that you tell you about. So, Michael, wait, the smell of money. I, what does Larry mean when he means that's the smell of money? Is anyone going to – are 99% of people, when they go to a property and it's disheveled or it's got a bad aroma from cats or, God forbid, it's something's dead inside, how do they usually react? They want to get out of there quick. They want to get out of there, and they want to get out of there very quick. Um Thank you for sharing that because I read a story that happened somewhere this year where someone – they found a, a real estate agent, went into a property and found a, a body in the property. Yeah. Wow. Do you know in California, part of the realtors' a disclosure laws in there, if there was a death in the property, they have to actually disclose that? Do that here too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah same thing in Georgia. Uh, for, uh, I, I think uh, a lot of the Asian culture, for religious reasons, um, that is a bad omen or sign. It's, or they have to do a some kind of exorcism or something like that. John, you live in Florida. You must. How many people die with golf clubs in their hands? Yeah, it happens. <laughs> they went down swinging. <laughs> oh, who said that? It's <laughs> <laughs> your new caller. <laughs> um, I did that. Uh, did everybody see um, the uh, YouTube video I did um, on my uh, prognostications for 2015? No, I believe I've seen it. Yes, yesterday. Okay, good, good. Now, basically, I'm taking a, I don't want to say rose-colored glasses, but I'm very optimistic uh, because uh, of the interest rates are still low, the economy's growing finally, uh, unemployment is lower, uh, hiring is up, and the big thing for me is uh, uh, gas. Here in Colorado, I think it's two twenty nine, two thirty right now. Is anyone under $2? In, in any part of the country? My stepdaughter in Minneapolis just got a Costco for under $2 yesterday. How do you think this is going to affect um, the future of real estate and the economy? I, is the U.S. finally moving forward? Well, until they run all the frackers and all the uh, oil refiners out of business, then, it'll, then, then OPEC will, you know. Do you think that's going to happen? That's free enterprise, and they're making a good buck now and putting the Arabs and the Russians. Anybody hear what what's going on in Russia and all these other uh, oil-producing countries, the ruble is think, is think, gone in the toilet. I think it's geopolitical. I, mean, I got to remember because I was long oil. You know, I trade futures and commodities and stuff, and I was long oil because I, I thought it couldn't go as low as it did, but uh, it kind of whacked me. But I think it's um, I think there's geo geopolitical motives. I mean, it, it just. Uh, but we're benefiting, just, aren't we? Yeah. Well, absolutely. I mean, it's more, it's more discretionary income, but I believe that you're going to have, you know, when they. Uh, when OPEC didn't step in and um, re reduce their production there at Thanksgiving, and the market kind of tanked again, I think I think it's to either there's a couple things that I think and I, well, I, it's either obviously to uh, to be punitive towards Russia, and maybe more importantly to be punitive towards like ISIS because they get a lot of their they get a lot of their money for worldwide terrorism through the, the oil well oil fields that they've uh, acquired through their processes so I think all and then I think they're trying to um, I think the, the major producers are trying to um, beat up on the, uh, you know 
it happened. I was in the lumber business, and it would always happen the same way in the lumber building material business. You know, they they drive it down to some so many mills which get out of business, and then you know the, the big boys are still hanging in there. I think they're maybe trying to <clears throat> you know make it unprofitable for the fracking industry and some of that stuff. So, don't you believe? Don't you don't you think the um, the entrepreneurship, the flexibility of American free enterprise, though, maybe I'm being a rose-colored glass again. I think, you know, this new technology and stuff, without getting into the environmental issues, which are big, um, but I, I think America can always find a better way, and this seemed to me like a big game-changer. Well, you, you think America's responsible for lower oil prices? I think it's supply and demand. I think it's real simple. I think it's just they're producing a product and we're ex aren't we exporting oil right now because we have so much? Yeah, but there's there's a there's a point that you know, there's a break even point. Yeah, you know, whether you're a sawmill or you're an oil refiner or you're a frack or whatever. And and I don't know what that I don't profess to know what that number is. But there's a there is a break even number for those where they're all they're quick producing. So um, I you know I think about it I, maybe simplistically I think about a, a mom. Uh, working at a McDonald's, getting um, minimum wage and everything, and all of a sudden she, instead of paying sixty, seventy dollars to fill up her tank, now it's it's forty dollars, thirty five dollars, or something like that. That that money's got to come back, hopefully, into our society and and filter through somehow. So I'm hoping. I guess it depends if it's long term or short term uh, on this. Um, well, there's a question. I think that's discretionary income. Yeah. The key is if it's long term or short term. I mean, in 1980, we stopped counting uh, energy and food as part of the um, uh, inflation uh, index. So, wow. know, <laughs> energy and food, of course, are huge daily factors in people's lives. And if that's no longer counted as a, an inflationary uh, item, then you know, it's like, oh, well, inflation's down. Well, not if you're paying that much in food and energy. So. Exactly. Um, and I'm sorry to bring up such a, I think it's a very topical question at the last minute here. We're out of time. I have two, qu I have two quick things to share with you guys, two new pieces of software that I'm using that are phenomenal. One is called, I'm going to pronounce it wrong, it's Waze or Waze, W-A-Z-E. It's Waze. a Waze. Is everybody using this? It's a it's a traveling application. It it ties into your map and it shows you where the police are hiding and taking radar, where there are accidents, where the uh, potato salad truck flipped over, and it's a social networking application. Uh, one of my clients is an attorney also who's working with this company, and I've been using this when I when we go back to San Diego or something. And it's a phenomenal application to, to keep you aware of what's going on on the road without using a fuzz buster or a CB or whatever. Um, it, it's a lot of fun. You, you just dated yourself, Fuzz Buster. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Gosh, I'm, I'm still listening. I'm still listening to Joe Cocker. She came in through the bathroom window. He died two weeks ago. You know, stuff like what that. that. The other song. <laughs> I loved A Track. There was something very special. Real last thing, you, you, who remembers eight tracks? Oh boy, am I old, showing my age now. Before my time. You remember Led Zeppelin, uh, and they do Stairway to Heaven, and they'd get to the great crescendo, crescendo, and she's buying a stairway, and then the eight track would kick in. You know when it changed channels and go clunk clunk clunk, and go to heaven. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was the worst way to listen to music. And there's something I really miss. Does anyone miss all, remember all the tape on the side of the road and the plastic containers everywhere you looked on? Every road in America, there was a magnetic tape on the side of the road. <laughs> the, I di but, but, but we digressed. And the last, and another software of the year, Apple nominated it the software, it's called Storehouse. S-T-O-R-E, house, H-O-U-S-E. And you can do, the, and I did this on my Facebook page uh, from the webinar, uh, from the workshop we did in Hawaii. You can take pictures and videos and literally in five minutes make a beautiful presentation with text and everything you want right on your phone or your iPad. It, it's, and and it, I think it's free or it's $1.99, I forget. It's fantastic. And uh, hey, guys, the hour went fast, didn't it? Did it, did, does anyone want to give the last word? Yeah, what's that video? Which video? I'm sorry. 
Or is that somebody that's there? Uh, the F U C K I N G O T N U K E S. I'm sorry, you lost me. You guys can't see that? No. I see it. Yeah. You just gotta just, oh, my you just read it out loud. That's what it says. <laughs> Yeah, I got it. Oh, okay. Is that the Max guy there? Yep, yep. Oh, is that guy? Oh, okay. Okay, I can't see. I kind of just, I kinda just, I kinda just randomly stumbled into here. I, I, I didn't even know you were doing this. Uh, this is just sort of random. Oh, I, mean, I was looking to talk. I was looking to talk to you, Claude, but uh, I'm, I'm I didn't know this was going on. Oh yeah, we do, we do this once in a while. Uh, Max, you can call me in about three minutes. Let me go potty, and I can I'll be glad to speak with you. Sweet, sweet. Okay, so just Skype me. Everybody, have a wonderful 2015. You guys are great. Thanks for participating. Um, so go to my Facebook page. I'll put a link on for this video, or I'll send it to you uh, um, directly through Dropbox or something like that. And um, you guys were great. Thank you. John? Yeah, I'll be uh, making the call. i got to start presenting in that, in that training room, so I want a little few tips. So. Excellent. Very good, guys. Take care. Have a great weekend. Max, I'll talk to you in two minutes. Okay, see you later. Bye-bye, everybody.